is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 170 of the Rebel Author Podcast. I cannot believe we have reached the end of another year. This is the last episode of 2022, uh, but of course we will be back next year with a jam-packed schedule of amazing guests and uh, uh, speakers. So yes, thank you for listening this year. A little, um, yeah, a little warm, glowy, soft, squidgy heart moment from me. I'm extremely grateful to everybody who listens to the show and of course to all of the show's patrons. I hope that this December, whether you're in the midst of summer or you are having a wintry uh, Christmas, Hanukkah or, or whatever holiday that you celebrate, I hope that you are having a wonderful time with family and um, yeah, your, your December is full of joy. Okay, so today I am speaking to C.L. Polk. And we are going to be talking all about how to write feminist fiction. But first to last week's question, which was thinking towards next year and the things you might need to put in place to help you achieve your goals. What motivates you? We actually didn't really have any answers, which is surprising to me because I thought we might get quite a few this time. Obviously, it was a trickier question than I anticipated. Um, So, but Vans said, such a valuable episode, especially for a complete newbie like myself. Your podcast has done, ah, your podcast has done wonders towards my writing journey. Thanks for all your work. Thank you for that wonderful comment. That's made my day. Thank you so much. Okay, so... This week's question is very predictable, all things given. Uh, So this week's question is, what are your goals for 2023? Okay, I am not going to uh, do my goals on this episode because I will be speaking to the ever lovely Rachel Heron and we are going to share our goals. Now, if you're a patron, you will get that on the 1st of January and for everybody else listening, you will get that on the 1st of February. So it'll be a little bit late, but hey, we all love a little bit of New Year's energy. So um, you'll get another burst of that in February. Okay, so book recommendation of the week this week is a little bit different. I thought I would round up my year of reading. So uh, it is the 22nd of December as I record this, Thursday the 22nd of December, and I'm probably going to finish up another two books. So I reckon I will have read 102 books this year, a little bit less than last year. Last year I read 120, uh, but I did fall into a massive pit of uh, reading woe uh, partway through this year. I think it was in April that happened, and I really didn't read for quite a while. So And also, for some reason, I've been a lot slower. This tail end of the year might be something to do with the fact that I've worked my fucking arse off this half of the year. But suffice to say, I haven't read quite as much as I anticipated. However, 102, pretty fucking good. Right, so what I wanted to do in this episode is share with you my three favourite non-fiction books and three favourite fiction books of the year. So we're going to start with non-fiction. Now, what I noticed when I went to review my Goodreads was that I actually haven't read as much uh, nonfiction as I normally do. Normally, I read a shit ton of nonfiction. I'm about 50-50 typically. However, just 36% of the books that I've read, so I just checked Goodreads, and so out of 100, I've read 36 nonfiction, which is considerably lower than normal for me. And I think I feel that. I think that is reflected in... Um, the fact that I have been getting the non... Well, so I read nonfiction to grow and learn, right? And obviously I've been doing so much strengths coaching that I've been learning in a different way this year, I think. Um, And it's also reflected in the fact that I've been writing more fiction. I very much um, spew out what I put in. So you know, I have been reading a lot more fiction this year and lo and behold, I have written more fiction this year. So I, yeah, I think it is reflective of that. So 36% was nonfiction and whatever the other half was, 74%, no, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. The other half was um, fiction. So my recommendations or my my roundup 
So the three non-fiction, and these are in no particular order, were Happy Money by Ken Honda, which I thought was fantastic. Kind of a money mindset and like a little bit woo-woo, I'll be honest, uh, a way of looking at money. Quit by Annie Duke, which Joanna Penn recommended, and uh, it has just been, oh my goodness me, it was mind-blowingly brilliant. Um, and then the last one was Relentless by Tim S. Grover. Now, t I read Winning by Tim last year. Tim is the guy who coached the likes of Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, um, all of the big name basketballers, basically. And he is highly competitive. <laughs> and of course, of course, I was going to love that book. Um, so yeah, those were my top three nonfiction. My best fiction of the year. Okay, so I've got three and a special mention as well. So uh, in no particular order, Queen Takes Rose by Katie Robert. That was the book that is responsible for the whole, like blowing the water, blowing everything out of the water, Ruby Row like appearing basically as I realised that there were ways and means in which I could write really cool stuff that I wanted to read. <laughs> okay, so King of Battle and Blood by Scarlett Sinclair was the other one. That is just basically pure vampire smut with some story thrown in. I loved it. I loved every second. It was pure escapism, fun, uh, naughty, sexy vampire fiction. And like, I don't if I've ever said this on the podcast but my literal favorite type of story is vampire fiction like I don't know how I haven't written a vampire series yet don't worry I'm planning one but uh yeah my favorite uh fiction is always vampire fiction okay and then the la last one is Darkest Night by Alessa Thorne so Alessa was on the podcast uh recently recently I don't know time is a lie she was on the podcast this year and um I read Darkest Night by her. Fuck me. Like, I just, I devoured it. It was, it's everything. It is naughty. It's enemies to lovers. There's mercenaries. Um, it's just like, and also I love her as well. So like, just, go, yeah, do yourself a favor. Go read the book. Okay. And then the last one is a special mention to Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. So Travis is also coming on the uh, podcast. And, but I read his book first and then pitched him. And, oh, God, it just, it reminded me of like House in the Cerulean Sea and that kind of warmth and quiet, comforting joy that you get from a book. And so that's why I am including it because I adored it, but in a different way than the other three. And I think the other three are all of that kind of spicy, intense, like, sexy romance that I'm really into at the moment. Uh, however, Legends and Lattes was fucking amazing as well. And I think everybody should read it. So those were my uh, recommendations for the year, my favourite books. I would also just like to make a mention that um, I have read some um, advanced copies, some beta copies of books that would have made it into my top books of the year. But because they're not published, I didn't want to mention them. Uh, and so I'm sure they will get included in next year's roundup. So these are the only books I have included are published books. Okay, so in personal update and news then, well, it is the 22nd of December. And so I mean, I'm fighting with myself, if I'm honest, because I <laughs> so much to do for this launch. Um, I have tried really fucking hard to get as much of it done as possible for the Christmas holidays so that I can have time off in the Christmas holidays. I'm like mentally, my brain wants to shut down and be like, fuck work, <laughs> it's the holidays. Uh, but also there's the strategic part of my brain that's like, motherfucker, if you don't do all of this work, we ain't gonna be launching well. Um, so I'm very, I'm sort of like yo-yoing in my own brain. Part of me is trying to shut down and relax and the other part's like, fuck, <laughs> like literally squealing like in my head. I don't know if you guys have seen the meme. Um, it's like the gif that you can send on all of the places that you can send gifs. And it's like a little dog at a table and everything's on fire. Like <laughs> that's that right now is the inside of my brain in the best way possible of course because I'm like super excited for everything at the moment um but also I'm like oh my god I need to do this I need to do this I need to do this I need to do that uh so ah, oh, yeah I'm just I'm like loving everything also I just want to say thank you so fucking much for the reception to Ruby Row. I cannot tell you how many comments, emails, uh, DMs, messages that I have received about Ruby. Um, and I'm just so fucking grateful, like literally so grateful because 
I don't know. I don't know what I expected, but like everybody has been amazing. So thank you. And also a number of people have said um, thank you to me for being kind of like authentic and and vulnerable, like and just sharing (laughs) like all of my shit. (laughs) And I just feel like, I don't know. I didn't even realize that was what I was doing. I'm just kind of sharing everything. (laughs) I have no boundaries. No, I'm kidding. I have boundaries. But, you know, like, I just I just wanted to share the truth, like the truthful things to me and like the lessons learned. And I don't I don't I don't want to hide those. I don't feel like I need to hide those. Like, yeah, OK, <laughs> like the maybe awkward, squishy, weird bits inside. But like we have to share those because otherwise, how do we know that we're not alone? And that's that's sort of what I'm doing. The other thing that I wanted to tell you all is that I will be doing a, I'm kind of already plotting this in my brain, but I am going to do a complete, uh, like, this is what I did, step by step by step, um, uh, in order to create the pen name, the work, the the processes, um, all of the things I applied for, like the tours, the research, all of the work in this launch. And um, if I'm feeling brave enough, I will share the numbers as well. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see about the numbers. But um, yeah, I am going to try and be as um, uh, open and honest as I can be. But I'm not going to do that until after the launch so that I do have the data uh, to hand. So over Christmas, (laughs) what do I need to do? fuck me so much okay so over Christmas I have now written my warm reader magnet which is going to go at the back of the book and I need to write a cold reader magnet so that I can so warm reader magnet being somebody who's read the book and um, they'll click the link in the back of the book to sign up to my mailing list and get a short story and then uh, which I am by the way calling a (laughs) smutologue that's like my favorite new word as a smutologue because it's an epilogue that's full of smut (laughs) Oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll just, let me just move on. Um, And then I am going to write, yes, a cold reader magnet. So for people who haven't read the book, uh, it's a prequel. And I am hoping uh, that I will be able to use that to build my mailing list. So that is what I need to do. It's a novella, I've outlined it. I'm hoping it's gonna be less than 20K. When I'm gonna write that 20K over Christmas, I don't fucking know because I've outlined book two and book two is getting written in January. So um, (laughs) I'm running out of time. (laughs) Over Christmas, I'm also going to need to uh, do the editor's edits, format the book, get the arcs out, and um, also order proof copies and things because the hardback and um, paperback covers just came in this morning. So I need to get those. They they need a couple of tweaks and then they should be finished as well. Um, And then... It's just like small things like mailing list stuff. So all of that kind of needs to be done. <laughs> God, I'm sorry. I just feel a bit hysterical about how much I need to try and get done in between Christmas and like taking some time off. Fuck me. Anyway, so yes, that's all the stuff that's going on for me right now. Um, and it feels amazing that I can actually fucking talk about it in detail now. Thanks, Ruby. Uh, so yes, my website's done and um, I just need to attach the reader magnets uh, to the mailing list and all the pop-ups and stuff. So yeah, all, all of that good stuff um, is is the background stuff. And, and this, I'm, this is why I'm going to do a proper podcast so that I can take you through it step by step almost like a this is how you yeah I mean this that's what it's going to be it's going to be a this is how you launch a book and pen name from scratch and I will tell you everything that I did okay so on the audiobook of the anatomy of a bestseller we have been working on the mastering of that it has um, been run through a new piece of software and it's made the audio so fucking good so it has taken a little bit longer uh, but I am hoping to get that back very soon Uh, and get that going through the channel. So that will be released in uh, the new year. Okay, enough waffling from me. I think we should move right on. So the Rebel of the Week this week is Jasmine Arch. Jasmine says, my hands down favorite family rebels have got to be the women I descend from. My grandmother was a young girl during World War II and she and her family had to survive in Nazi-occupied Germany despite the fact that my great-grandfather got conscripted into forced labour and was deported to Germany. He did return home safely, by the way, but before he left, he dug out a bomb shelter in the backyard so his family could be safe during the bombings. 
First time the air raid alarms went off, my great-grandmother gets her two kids, heads to the shelter, and it was so full of neighbours there was no room for them. So back inside it was, and they hid under the kitchen table instead. What? But it was in their garden? Fast forward a little while, food is getting so scarce, people are seriously threatening to starve. My great-grandmother, badass that she was, rolled up her sleeves, became a housekeeper and cook for German officers stationed in their town, and brought home enough scraps to not only feed her own children, but to help keep the families in her street eating as well. The formidable woman that she was, uh, no way those neighbours who had taken over her shelter cringed under her gaze as... Uh, they accepted those scraps. By the time I came along, she'd mellowed considerably, but I wouldn't have wanted to piss her off, that's for sure. Was that enough? Of course not. She also smuggled butter and eggs from the nearby farm and passed on her badass genes to her daughter. Once my great-grandmother was too sick for smuggling shenanigans, so my gran went inst instead. 13 years old, sitting on a train with a basket of contraband food under the bench, hidden behind her skirt and legs... <laughs> German officers walked up, walk up to her and asked for her papers in German. Basically, she cold-facedly uh, kept repeating, I don't understand German, until they left. Kind of daunting trying to live up to a legacy like that, but we try. That is incredible. I can't imagine how terrifying that must have been as a situation. But wowza, what an inspiration the women in your family are. That is apps. I've actually got goosebumps having just finished reading that. So um, yeah, incredible, incredible story. I love that. Okay, if you would like to be a Rebel of the Week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, something big, something small, or something in between. It doesn't even need to be your rebellion. It could be a family rebellion. You can email your Rebel story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to V.E. Griffith, who upped uh, his pledge, and to Jessica Samuels, who I believe is a returning patron. So thank you so, so much. Returning, joining, uh, staying. I appreciate each and every single one of you. You help to keep this show running. You help to pay for my time. You also, more importantly, like make me feel like this is worthwhile and that it's helping and that it's doing something uh, valuable. So yeah, I really, really appreciate you guys. If you would like to get early access uh, uh, to all the episodes as well as bonus content like joining me for question and answer, poison and prose, uh, writing sprint sessions, joining the rebel challenge, a quarterly challenge where we host uh, challenges and uh, uh, we have spreadsheets where we track all our goals. You can join the Slack group, which is a community chat where you can get access to me and to like a hundred other writers where we all chit chat and uh, answer, each other, answer each other's questions and support each other. There's movie nights. There is the rebel masterclasses where we read and deconstruct a book together. Uh, and I teach you for two hours every quarter. So there is stacks and stacks of content. If you would like to do that, then you can join from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Okay, that is it from me this episode we're going to get on with the uh, interview but first let me just say once again thank you so much for listening to this show I, I really do appreciate it and you know there is no show without the listeners so I hope that you have a wonderful end of the year I hope that your new year is full of joy um, and full of inspiration and motivation and let us go and fucking smash 2023 hello and welcome to the rebel author podcast today I am joined by C. L. Polk. C. L. wrote the Hugo-nominated series, The Kingston Cycle, including the WFA winning Witchmark. The Midnight Bargain was a Canada Reads, Nebula, Locus, Ignite, and WFA finalist. They have worked as a film extra, sold vegetables on the street, and identified exotic insect species for a vast collection of, and you're going to have to pronounce this one for me, is it Lepidoptera? Lepidoptera. Okay. Um, is that butterflies? No. Uh, yeah. It's butterflies, moths, and skippers. Excellent. Uh, before settling down to write fantasy novels. Polk lives in Calgary, which is on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Hello and welcome. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm very excited because I had an outcry from my patrons to, to pitch you and to ask you to come on the show because they all love your work. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm really glad. 
No, yeah, I'm I'm delighted. And I, and funnily enough, uh, my, my coach had also recommended uh, your work to me recently as well. So it was all like this very beautiful, serendipitous timing. And then you wrote a sapphic book of, of which as a queer woman, I was like, <laughs> so I, I'm very excited to talk to you. But before we dive into the questions about your work, I wondered if you could tell everyone a little bit about you and how you got to where you are. Um, okay, so I'm Seal Polk. Uh, I'm a fantasy novelist, and uh, I got into this mess because eight years after I'd quit writing forever, I literally woke up one morning and I wanted to write a story. Um, and because I wasn't concerned with what I was concerned with before, which was writing a good story of publishable quality so that I could get into the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association and become a pro novelist and all this, I just wanted to write a story. I wanted to get lost. I turned to fanfic and I wrote an AU supernatural fanfic um, and uh, people liked it. And so I kept having more ideas. And then finally I came up with an idea that I thought was maybe a little bit out there for my readers. I wasn't sure what, what I was going to do with it exactly, but it was such a good idea that I had to write it. And as I was doing the planning for the book, I realized that it couldn't be an AU supernatural fanfic. There was no way. This main character just, it didn't fit. It wasn't like there was no way I could cram this vision I had in my head. So I decided that I would just write it about whoever it was that the character was. So I named him Miles. And then I went to work and um, I wrote Witchmark. Um, and I put it away for about a year. I wrote some more fanfic. Um, and then I came back to it and said, oh, this is dreadful. And I had to fix it. So I fixed it. Um, and then I sent it out to agents because I just wanted to see what would happen. It was like the rule that I was basically brought up with as a young writer. And that was write it, finish it, send it out into the world. It is no longer your business. So I did that. And I got an agent. And I got a publishing deal and this is what I do now. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. It's like a dream journey. I, I didn't know that you um had a, or, or I don't know how I would know that, but of course I didn't know that you had a big break, but I love that writing pulled you back and that story pulled you back and didn't let go. I think that is, I just, I love that because I feel like story is that strong in us, in, in those of us who are put on this planet too, right? There is no way we yeah. can stay away for too long. Okay, so we're going to focus on um, a couple of your books and um, kind of uh, world building was was one of the areas that I wanted to talk about and um, feminist fiction. So I mm -hmm. uh, uh, want to thank you very much to Lynn, patron, uh, who uh, has helped me uh, create some of these questions for you. So the first question is, do you go into a story wanting to convey a message, be it about gender equality or something else? And if so, like, what do you go in knowing? Like, what do you go in aiming to do structurally or thematically? Hmm, okay. Well, I mean, I think probably the, the book that I wrote with, like the clearest themes around gender equality would be the midnight bargain because instead of just saying, okay, well, we're just going to assume that everybody's gotten their heads together and figured out that this is sensible and we're not going to fuss about it anymore. I actually put it out there because I was specifically angry about reproductive rights in the United States when I was writing it. Um, I would say just as I had started writing, there were three states that had all basically legislated abortion bans that made they basically invalidated Roe versus Wade though officially they didn't invalidate Roe versus Wade and this annoyed me greatly <laughs> and and as I was thinking about it what I was thinking the most was it's not it's not even about this it's just that they want women to not have power and agency because if you saddle them with like all of these responsibilities that basically trap them economically and socially then 
you're effectively controlling women. It's like, it's like totalitarian state 101. And it made me mad. So I um, had to come up with like, I had to come up with a way to kind of talk about what I was really angry about. And, um, and so that's where the midnight bargain came from, specifically that anger. Um, other stories, it's just basically like, I'm just writing about people and their circumstances. And like in the Kingston cycle, um, the society isn't terribly sexist. Like, I mean, there is some, but not really a lot. Um, and then my new novel at novella, whatever it is, um, even though I knew the end is deeply sexist because it's set in America in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and there's homophobic undertones as well. Which oh, is, yeah. so much. So much yeah. homophobia. Oh, my gosh. I re- yeah, I, 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 we'll, we'll talk about that one when we get to that one. Um, so how do you, how do you, like, what is your process? Are you an outliner? Do you pants as to want, for want of a better word? I'm, I'm a world builder. I, like, I kind of, like, the reason why I am a fantasy writer more than any other kind of writer is because I like making up worlds or I like thinking about our world if this one major physics divine thing was a real thing and how would that affect everything else that kind of um that a very specific kind of daydreaming (laughs) is what I do and so I will think about you know well what if um what if the world was like this and then I'll be like okay well what else can I think about and then the next thing I know I have an entire society on my hands and there's some kind of problem in it that interests me so then I'm like well who would be affected by this and here come the characters (laughs) um and so then I figure out what their situation is and it's I don't outline the story I don't like to write down a very complete plan for the story um, because I have this thing where if I say I'm going to do something, then I'm going to do it. But I find that in writing, I have to change my mind a lot. And mm-hmm. if I've written an outline, then I said I'd do something and now I'm not going to do it. And this will stop me for ever, forever, because I don't know how to solve the problem of a, I said I would do this, so I'm going to do it. But B, this is a much better idea and my characters won't actually do A anymore. And for some reason, I just can't say, well, you know, screw this plan. I'm going to go with this unless I go with plan B all the way. That sounds like a restorative issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very definitely, yeah. Everybody drink because we mentioned strengths already. Um, okay. <laughs> so, and, and sort of leaning into that fantasy aspect then. How do you create balance? Um, like, and specifically with the Midnight Bargain to reflect like real life gender inequality, but in a fantastical way. And like where, like for newer writers, how do they find that line between making a point, like a societal or like a political point, but also keeping the story engaging, you know, and not kind of preaching? So I think probably this thing is, is that you can't tell people that oppression is bad. You have to give them a character, someone they love, someone that they can imagine being, and then you oppress them. Mm. And, and you oppress, you oppress them in a very specific way and you allow them to have the feelings for their character going into the circumstance where they are being oppressed in this very specific way so that you're tapping in on the reader's outrage and say but how could they do this this is terrible this is horrible this is unfair and that's that's what you do you don't you don't have a bunch of people sitting around in a parlor um you know drinking little cups of tea and arguing about why communism is the best economic system of all of them 
you go and you show them what it's like to have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go to work for an 11 hour day and get paid nothing, but you can't stop because if you stop, you'll lose your home. You'll lose your medical care. You'll lose your kid's education because you'll have to move to a different neighborhood. And the laws say that you have to go to the school that your neighborhood funds, even if that's not as good a school as you were in before, because the property taxes in your new neighborhood are lower. Everything will fall apart if they don't endure this. It's unfair. It's horrible. You're angry for this person. And in this way, you get to be angry for yourself too. Yeah. And I, and anger is a, is, is something that I want to come on to because I love angry women. Like, <laughs> like I am an angry woman. I am a very angry woman. <laughs> it's like I rage and roar. And I almost feel like half of my sparkle, half of my power, half of my uniqueness. I don't know. My mm-hmm. gift to the world is my anger. But mm-hmm. saying that, that is frowned upon by society, you know, in air quotes, well, right? Like it's the millennia long agenda to control us. I mean, like it's nothing major. Just get over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but right. The, the, the thing is, how do you create powerful female characters without making them alienating to readers? Because I think so often you'll get this powerful female character or an angry female woman and it rubs people up the wrong way. And yet I genuinely believe in my core that this is how we create change. You've got to be angry. Otherwise nobody changes anything because we all sit in our fucking habitual habits and don't do anything to change the world. I I think honestly, like trying to give somebody who wants to read my book, a powerful woman who isn't going to rub them the wrong way is not my job. So I don't do it. I, I I simply don't. Um, there's a reality that I had to face as a writer who's publishing stories for money. Not everyone is going to love my books. Not everyone is going to be willing to put up the money to buy one of my books, read one of my books, or they will read one and they don't want to read another one. That's not my problem. <laughs> it's just, it's not. I I'm here for the people who want my books, my ideas, and my stories. I want to be where I'm welcome. Um, And if somebody is alienated by women in books, that's not a problem that I'm equipped to assist them with. The book will be there if they change their mind, and I hope they have a nice day. Okay, so what craft advice would you have to somebody who wants to write a feminist fiction and somebody who would like to have like an empowered female character in their story? Well, okay. So when you're coming up against a question, it's like, I want to write an empowered female character. Um, I think at first it takes a lot of thought and like literally years of thought. And for some of us, we started thinking about these things when we were little kids. And for some of us, we didn't have the opportunity to think about these things until recently. But I have a writing exercise that I'd like to pose to people um if we don't mind yeah i'd love that okay so this is what i want you to do i want you to run an experiment i want you to take a story that you have already written if it's a short story that's wonderful but if it's not then pick an entire chapter of a book a nice long one about five thousand words at least this piece of writing has to have at least one man and at least one woman in it. And the man and the woman need to have goals and needs and flaws and problems and virtues. And these two characters interact with each other throughout the passage that you are doing the experiment with from start to finish. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take that, turn it into a file, make a copy of it, and then systematically trade the names and pronouns of each character and see what happens to the story you just told. And read it and see what seems strange or wrong about the story now. And wonder, okay, why? 
why does this seem strange to me? And I'm not trying to say that they should be easily interchangeable. That's absolutely not the point um, because that's not good writing and that's not the feminist ideal. The exercise is specifically so that you as a reader can flip the switches on yourself and see what you assume men do that women don't do and things that women do that men don't do and allow yourself to question those things and, you know, maybe even to feel uncomfortable with this thing that you didn't actually really think about before or to be angry because this is how it's supposed to go or whatever it is that you're feeling. And then what I want you to do is I want you to take these two files and I want you to digitally shred them so that you never have to see them again <laughs> and nobody can see them. It is a secret. Only you are in this exercise. This is completely yourself, your feelings, your thoughts. Protect them. I love that so much. This could be, it could be embarrassing. It could be painful. Um, and so, like, I don't, like, I don't want to give this exercise lightly. Like, it's a very serious exercise because you don't know what you're going to unfold when you do it. Yeah, I love this. I think I think that is. I was kind of thinking about it and thinking about scenes in things that I've read that I've written that I could flip and how the scene would play out. And mm -hmm. like, I definitely like. I was also thinking about something that I'm writing now, and I was thinking about how a lot of the qualities that men are praised for, women are um what's the word the opposite of price are like they're denounced for them yeah but those and, are and the all the qualities that i love the reverse is true like if you wrote a scene where a man is sitting in a room and a woman comes in and she has like six shopping bags of amazing clothes at fantastic bargains and it's a basically a whole capsule wardrobe one afternoon expedition and it's perfect and a man comes in and it's like look at these pants they're amazing and my butt looks so good at them i can't believe it and they go perfectly with this button-up shirt and this t-shirt also i found this funny logo t-shirt that says namaste bitches i adore it people are going to be like well is he gay i was like well, well no what if he's not what if he just likes clothes what if he likes to look good what if he likes being handsome and well-dressed Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like I I know lots of guys who like to be handsome and well dressed and smell good and have hair appointments and go to the spa. Like they're good looking people. And we yeah. benefit from their presence. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I think yeah, I think this is so interesting and it does play into like gender norming and like the mm -hmm the the stereotypes that society is giving us like having my I have a son who is almost nine and I constantly have to come up oh well, I don't want that well why not well because it's pink so like why would well worse a girl's color and I'm like oh, oh, oh no we are not we are not having it so my eight-year-old knows about gender norming and like I, I try and pull it up as much as possible because otherwise we it's like it's like like command if we take command as a Clifton strength right so often yeah, yeah. If a woman has command, they are, as you say, denounced for it. And yet it I find it like my wife is number one command. I think it's sexy. <laughs> you know? So <laughs> yeah, anyway, I'm just I'm going off now. <laughs> I need to get back to the question. Yeah, I just like that's the thing too, is that you know, you get to examine this. It's like, well, what does it look like when you write a character who is a man? who says, you have to watch this movie. I cried so hard at the end. Yeah. Or or you have a woman and it's like, they say, you know, can you come for drinks after work with us? And she says, no, no I'm sorry. I have I have long sword practice. I have to go. Yeah. Like, and, and see, the thing in my brain here is that a lot of people, if you give them these examples, they will say, oh, well, the chick is obviously sexy because she can kick my ass. It's like, but the guy is obviously obviously sexy because he is in touch with his feelings and you can like hold his hand and you can squeal about the movie and you can feel 
more emotionally open with him because he's emotionally open too. Like that's wonderful. But you know, if you want and violence healthy. then go ahead. Yeah. Like <laughs> wonderful and healthy, right? Like I uh, yeah. If a new author came to you and said, I would like to write feminist fiction, where would you tell them to start? I would tell them to actually start with feminist nonfiction. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you have, I don't, I know I'm putting you on the spot. I don't suppose you have any recommendations, do you? I actually, I have an author. I, you know, if I could, if I could gently ask everyone to like read a book, one book, just please read it. I'm going to say Bell Hooks is all about love, but I, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough call because I also want to say Bell Hooks is feminism is for everybody. Now this is an old book. Um, I think she wrote it in the sixties. It's amazing. It's amazing because she talks about feminism in ways that like, this is the OG feminist book. Uh, like, Everybody who thinks about feminism today has to thank Bell Hooks. She's amazing. And she broke the ground for so much of what we think about and what we argue for and what we question today. She wrote it before I was even born. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. I will. Um, I'll try and dig those up before. So Bell is in like a ringing bell and then Hook. like a ringing bell. Bell okay. Hooks. Um, okay. She's written a bunch of really good books. Um, she is teaching, I believe. I think she's a professor. She's still writing. Um, she does. She did an entire like YouTube series of discussions with the New School. Um, if you just go to your search engine of your choice that doesn't actually like track your every move on the internet and type in bell hooks lectures new school you should be able to find tons of stuff i believe she's still currently publishing with haymarket books um probably my favorite uh publisher for social justice uh literature completely like it's just great i actually have their book of the month club <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Okay. I'm definitely, oh, I, I know one particular patron will be loving all of these recommendations. So thank you so much. Um, okay. So a couple of final questions about um, feminist fiction then. Do you think there, for a newer writer, do you think there are any kind of really big no-nos or boo-boos to avoid making or any mistakes they should avoid making? Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to put it as a mistake because it's not a mistake, but I have yet another writing exercise, write the feminist thought that you want to convey in a scene across the top. And then don't say that. Don't say it. So if you, if you say, well, naturally women should be paid exactly the same wage as men. Don't say that in the scene. Now write the scene. And make that be the thing that people understand that's what you're talking about in the scene. Um, a lot of the times, like when I, it was funny because there were a number of years back in the days when I was like not published and I was like in critique sites and stuff. Um, I ran into a number of men who were extremely threatened by feminism and had a very weird idea of what it was and what it meant. Um, and one of these men had written a story in which this woman who was supposed to be a feminist, you know, said and did the most ridiculous things. Like she was literally a straw woman so that he could like act out his violent fantasies of like, humiliating her um and but what was what it was really doing for me was i was thinking you know well who writes like this it's just like it's so wooden because everybody just stated their theses and then duked it out and i was like that's that's dumb like people will talk about the subject of feminism. They will have these arguments. They're very static and uninteresting though, unless you're in the room and you're the one actually having the conversation with somebody who, who either like really wants to know or 
doesn't actually want to know. They just, you know, want to score cool points off of you. I think so, I love. Yeah, I love. I'd say avoid confronting the subject directly. I love that because it also lends to character agency and ensuring that they are acting and doing within the within the story and that and enabling that like allowing that to show the reader what you, it is that you're trying to say so I love that mm-hmm. I, so my last question um is are there any particular things that you do marketing wise to kind of attract um a feminist fiction audience um I <sighs> I think probably what ends up happening is that I kind of let other people do that for me. (laughs) It's a bit like, I mean, I, I believe that everything that I've written so far is feminist fiction because I am feminist, like raised from diapers, a feminist, and I can't help it. Like there's literally nothing else I can do. Um, So I write the book that I can stand behind and I let people decide if I'm speaking to them. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does. All right. So you have a new book due very, very soon. If not, is it today? Is it due out today? It's today. Huh? It's out today. Congratulations. Happy launch day. Um, okay. So your new book, even though I knew the end, I read. It was fantastic. And the thing that I loved the most was the voice. Like, oh, right from the opening page, it's like, even though obviously there's no actual vocal voice in my head, there was a vocal voice in my head and it was kind of that Sin City smoky husk, kind of like a like a real, like, yeah, I don't know. It's like that husky noir narration. Did she and that sound like I, Kathleen Turner? I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. Oh, I, she's, she's an actor. She's an actor from the 80s. She is the star of an old 80s romantic comedy adventure film called Romancing the Stone. I would have to look it up. Definitely, definitely like a kind of husky, sexy, slightly deeper female voice. Um, And that's kind of how I read it. And yeah, oh, I loved it. So how the fuck did you do that? (laughs) How do you, do you create, create a noir voice? Well, okay. So the thing is, is that I, I had a real Raymond Chandler phase where I read a whole bunch of his books. And the thing is, is that, I would read them and I would think, you know, this prose is marvelous. It is stunningly brave. This guy couldn't write a woman with a gun held to his head. Like, it's just awful. (laughs) It's just like, he's not good at this thing. But like, what he's really excellent at doing is he is really excellent at writing the voice of somebody who is complete wise ass. And all of that is like trying desperately to paper over the soul of a hurt romantic who wants to love the world so much and expresses this in incredibly poetic figurative language that just goes for broke. Like a Raymond Chandler metaphor will either sail across the sky in a perfect arc or it'll be like, oh, oh dear. And there's really no in between. He doesn't do mediocre metaphors. Like it's just not something that he does. So I just decided that I was going to go full ham and let my editor say, not this one. And the thing is, is that my editor didn't say not this one. Like really all that often, I think maybe three times. And the rest of the time it was like, oh, smooth. And it was really, really gratifying. So do you like at the, at the sentence level, at the craft level, it were like, how did you, how do you do it? What, if, if, if you were to explain to somebody else how they create a noir voice, what would you say? Because it, it had a certain rhythm, a certain, I, I mean, I, I can't, I literally read it in that kind of voice. (laughs) Right. Yeah. One of the, one of the, the important things for writing, um, Helen Brandt's voice was that I really, really, really got deep on like, not just like, you know, detective pulp literature, but I got really, really deep on the, um, the way that people talked in movies, um, like the whole 
um, mid-Atlantic flat accent that is a manufactured accent that they only really used in like radio and film. I was very deliberately going for those cadences and those rhythms. Yes. Um, and the other thing too, is that like, I studied the slang pretty hard, like all of the vernacular, all of that, like the things that people said. Right. And then I found out what, what some of these old tiny things that I said actually meant. Like I always said, well, blow me down because I got it from Popeye cartoons. Well, blow me down means, well, kill me dead on the spot. And like, just all these kinds of things. Right. So um, I like basically I kind of had the command of the slang and I tried to use it as naturally as, as like I use slang myself. So, I mean, and the thing is, is that like, I, I love slang. I love vernacular. Like I love this informal language. So um, when I talk, I sound very different from when I write, <laughs> which sometimes really confuses people. But I was trying very hard to kind of get that, that way of speaking um, to go in there so that I, I wanted it to feel like you were listening to a radio play or that you were watching a silver screen film. Um, well, you did that. Like the director of photography <laughs> was David Lean. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's basically what I did was I studied my source material very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and like the thing, I mean, it really is a masterclass in creating voice. It is one of the voiciest things I've read in a while. And what I loved is that I could hear that noir tone, both in the dialogue, the characters were speaking, but also in the, in the narrative summary and like the narration part. And that was what Mm -hmm. I found so impressive is that it literally threaded through the, the whole, the whole story. Um, okay. So I don't want to give any spoilers because I hate spoilers myself, but one thing that you do do is create a very amazing bittersweet ending. So I wondered if you could talk about how to create a bittersweet ending. How do you know what bit should be bitter and what bit should be sweet? How do you create a balance that is satisfying? Um, well, I mean, even though I knew the end, very much like kind of like it almost wrote itself Uh, it's a little bit it was it felt a bit like cheating because I had a character who had a virtue that was so strong it became a problem and I didn't change that fact and that's why my ending is bittersweet it's because they they had this virtue so powerful it actually created problems for them And Helen's virtue is that she loves with her whole heart and that she would give anything or do anything for the people that she loves. And that's it, basically. Like, at that point, it was pretty obvious to me what had to happen. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting because I I was almost like, oh, oh, that was kind of of (laughs) my reaction to the end. And then I was like, I don't know whether to be happy or not. And that, which is like the perfect reaction to a bittersweet ending, right? Like that is that is the goal, is yes. to have those mixed feelings about it. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. I love the thought of the concept of not changing. So does that mean that Helen had a flat arc? Uh, like a flat character arc? Well, well, basically, I would say Helen absolutely like. Helen's art doesn't change. She doesn't change. And it isn't even that she had the ch- the power to change the world. Like her choice didn't change the world. She did exactly what she had to do. And I don't mean like I had to do it. I had no choice, but I, I did it and I, I do it again because it was the right thing. And so she's unwavering in that respect. Like she didn't have, she didn't have a flaw that that she needed to address uh, in order to succeed at the story or anything like that. She is exactly who she is. And this is a story that you tell about her. 
um, because her unchanging nature is what makes the story. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that it really is. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to stop there because I don't want to give any... I don't want to get anywhere near right, a spoiler. Right, because and we're, it's getting very this, hard. we're getting so close to spoiler. We then. are. So we're, we're, I'm going to back away because it's it's too good of a story to ruin the ending for anybody listening. So and I feel like we've been sufficiently vague that they're going to be like, the fuck are they even talking about? So it's fine. Just go read it. Um, <laughs> so okay. sorry. Come back and listen to the podcast again when you're done. Yeah. And then you can be like, oh. <laughs> All right. So my last question then. This book was like 130 odd pages. It was not long. And yet, mm-hmm. fuck, it, mm-hmm. there was so much in the book. How, like, how did you do that? It was so in depth in terms of like world building details. Like, it was such a detailed story in terms of like, the the Chicago setting, the 1940s, um, magicians, sig- sigils, demons, other people and creatures, um, like just there was a lot. How, mm-hmm. and it didn't feel like too much. It felt like, it just felt like a rich world. So how do you do that mm-hmm. in 130 pages? What are, tips or craft advice do you have? Step one, I did hundreds of hours of research. I researched the most amazing, ridiculous things. Uh, Worldcon was in Chicago earlier this year, and I was walking down the street with, um, with like friends and um, my e- my editor and a literary agent. And as we were walking, because the hotel was in the loop, and that's where Chicago is set, is we would walk past things, and I would say, "That's the blah 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 blah. It was built in do 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 do, and it's famous because of yabba yabba yabba." And they're like, how do you know this? It's like, I researched it for my book. And so when we got to the Tribune Tower, I was like, did you know that the Tribune bought a forest in like Canada so that they could log the trees to make their own paper and ship it so that they were able to print the Tribune? And they were like, they what? (laughs) It's like, yeah. It's like, how do you know this? It's like, I researched it for my book. Is that in the book? No, no, it's not. It's just a rabbit hole that I fell down as I was trying to capture this very small area in Chicago at this very specific point in time. Um, So step one, do hundreds of hours of research. Step two, create a character who knows all this stuff and takes it 100% for granted and would never think to mention anything outside of her direct experience. Yeah, that is that was the thing that I noticed. There was like literally no exposition whatsoever. Like e- even right on page one, it's like you are thrown in at the deep end, and you need to keep up because Helen ain't slowing down for you. <laughs> I I had a map. Like I literally found a map of the loop that was like done by a department of sociology. That was a bunch of different layers that told me like where the businesses were. Um, what the occupancy of like these various buildings were through like from like the turn of the century uh, up until the year and well beyond it too. It was like, when were the buildings like empty, you know, in the thirties during the great depression. That's when, that's when the, the detective business moved into this particular building that was built and blah, blah, blah. Like I knew all of this stuff. Like I went absolutely mad. And, and so like all of my details are, researched um like there's a mention of somebody who has an obituary in the paper and when i talk about the fact that they published like ladies home improvement magazines that was a major industry in chicago i researched the heck out of this it was so much fun how do you so when you've done these hundreds of hours of research you have like a metric fuckload of detail and content and and nitbit tidbits sorry how do you narrow that down how do you select what goes in and what doesn't um well part of the benefit is that um even though i know the end is written in first person so i have to embody my character i know what my character knows i see what my character sees i hear what my character hears feels tastes and knows about so i know all of these facts about the office building that she lives in she knows some of them um and that as she's telling the story to somebody, she will fill them in only a little bit because she's assuming that they already know a lot of this stuff. 
So she only talks about the really interesting things. And then in the most maddeningly vague of ways. Mm. I think the question is about embodying the historical aspect. Like, how did you make it feel, the world feel like 1940s? Like, how did you, what what were the, like, how, because I'm not a historical writer, so I find that really hard to do. And so, yeah, Yeah. I wanted to understand how you did that. Um, Well, I did, my answer is going to be infuriating because I did a lot of research. And a lot of the times, you know that thing that writers do where they are writing a thing and they say, wait a minute, what kind of wine did they drink in Italy in 1640? And then they go and they try to figure it out and they rabbit hole their way into like, you know, like some kind of drama between two warring vintner skills or whatever the heck it is. And then they come back and they say, red wine, and that's it. I don't let myself do that. I have a very strict time limit. It's like if I'm in line and I need to know something, I will set a timer. And I'll be like, is this a 10 minute question or a 20 minute question? And so if it's a 10 minute question, I give myself 10 minutes to find it. So I can't, I can't screw around. I got to find the answer. Um, and uh, Google was much better for this back when I was researching this. Google is kind of a wasteland now. It's not the search engine I would recommend. Um, just because it's been like really twisted. So it's not as easy to find good information from there. Um, so a lot of the times what I'll do is I will, um, I'm trying to think of something like there's a line in which she goes to a cafe. She goes into the cafe and she gets a copy of the Tribune and she basically sets the tone by talking about her personal opinions that are in opposition to the slant of the Chicago Tribune at the time. So she says, you know, the Trib is wrong about the New Deal and they're wrong about the war. (laughs) And and so you know what, you know, you know what she's talking about because you're like, oh, I know, oh, I know. So when I gave it the headline um, that basically was like naked desire for power stuns contrast. That was actually the headline in the Tribune on that day at that, that year. Oh it's my correct gosh, down to the moon up. phase. I it's love correct that. down to the moon phase. Oh my gosh, that is incredible. <laughs> that That is like true balcony input right there. Like That it is was, incredible. I, like, I have never had a more glorious time researching a story than I did for this one. It was balcony input all the way. (laughs) Oh, that's incredible. I absolutely love it. Oh, I can't believe it, but we are at the end of um, the podcast. So... um, Oh, I knew this would happen. (laughs) I know. (laughs) This is the Rebel (laughs) Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. I am not even really sure I have an inner rebel, you know, I've always been that person where you say, you should do this. And I'll say, why? And you have two choices. You can give me a good answer or you can have me not do the thing you just told me to do. (laughs) I mean, even asking why is a rebellion, right? Because it's not doing as you're told immediately. I think that, and also, you know, writing fiction that goes against the grain and makes political statements. Like, I think that is a rebellious act in itself. So I think, uh, I think you, I think you have a rebellious heart in there. Um, yeah. Okay. Would you like to tell everyone where they can find out more about you, your books or anything else you'd like to add? Um, okay. So I have a website. It's uh, really difficult. It's clpolk.com. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say you can always find me on Twitter, but um, I can't say that really anymore. I mean, I'm still there. Um, I have a link tree. So it's link tree slash CL Polk. And that is basically the running list of everywhere I seem to be like visiting lately. Um, So that might work. Um, If you just put link tree and CL Polk into any uh, web search browser, uh, that isn't tracking your every move on the internet, you should be able to find me. Amazing. And of course, you should go and read the book, even though I knew the end, even though I've already recommended it to you guys on the podcast. 
but uh, go and read it anyway if you haven't gone and picked it up. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as a bunch of bonus goodies, then you can by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You were listening to C.L. Polk, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm going to be speaking to Stephanie Detlefs, and we're going to be talking all about how to raise the emotional stakes in your novel. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.